Hello everybody. In these last difficult weeks, it's always been important for me not to get bogged down in all the projects that we'd planned for the audience and yet haven't been able to perform. I didn't want to spend my life crying over spilt milk. But the other day, a member of the public very generously and interestingly wrote to me to say that she was particularly disappointed and not being able to hear Madame Butterfly played by the Halle. And so I thought I might just say something about this work and why we wanted to make it one of the main projects of this season. I love Puccini. I've conducted many, many of his performances. In my view, Madame Butterfly is the greatest opera he wrote. It's the most interesting, the most serious in its purpose, and he succeeds wonderfully in portraying the characters and the narrative of the libretto. He thought, I think, that he'd achieved something different with this piece, and it's not difficult to see why. In it, he wanted to show the contrast, the tension, between the colonial aspirations of the Americans and the age-old, serious cultural traditions of the Japanese. This work was finished in 1904, and by that time, there'd been a number of other operas and plays about this particular interesting situation. Buccini in New York, when he'd been over there, had seen a performance of a great show by the entrepreneur Belasco, David Belasco. And that was about Madame Butterfly. And he saw the potential for an opera when he saw this great show. In it, he rose to the challenge of portraying the Japanese on the whole, with great seriousness and great beauty, as if he wanted us all to admire their culture and the atmosphere, the land, the society, into which the Americans were bursting with all their extrovert energy. And there had already grown up the idea that a visiting American could, for the period of his being based in wherever it was, Tokyo, you know, Nagasaki, he could actually buy himself a wife. And many a geisha girl was sold and a contract signed to enable him to have some sort of domestic life while he was in Japan. This basically is the situation at the beginning of Madame Butterfly. That Madame Butterfly as a work of art becomes a great tragedy, which is not something you can say about the other Puccini operas, is because the particular geisha who comes, whose nickname is Madame Butterfly because of her delicate, youthful, appearance and character is that she falls in love. She's not meant to do that. You were told not to. You were just there to be a friend, to be a lover, to look after the visiting Americans. But she found something in this man that she'd never seen before, of course, and she found something to love. She became pregnant and had a child. And the disaster that that develops into transforms her into a tragic heroine. Because of course, Pinkerton eventually returns with his new American wife and feels that he's entitled to take his child when he realizes that it exists. Puccini's music is extremely original and very surprising. And I think part of the reason for that is that he was interested in what was happening in France. There's a great influence of Debussy, Ravel, even Faure. But he also wanted to portray musically the Japanese people with the right amount of seriousness of purpose. And there are six or seven clear Japanese folk songs that he found. And there are other melodies that obviously he wrote himself that relate to them. But it's not just that. The way he portrays the Japanese, the seriousness with which they are characterised, the delicacy, the beauty, the incredible orchestration. And this was one of the reasons why I wanted the Halle to play this piece for you. It is, of course, a great opera to sing, particularly for the soprano, who bears the weight of responsibility for the whole evening. Once she's on stage, she's hardly ever off it. And the demands of the part dramatically grow through the evening. And as she makes this great journey, which is so unusual for a Puccini heroine, from a, a little harmless, carefree young girl to a mother, and a tragic heroine who in the end commits suicide, you realise that he has a chance to create something special. And the way her music develops in size and intensity is really remarkable. 
but I thought that this work would make a great concert and we could have done it in a slightly staged way, not totally staged, but with some physical movement because the narrative of the story is very vivid. There's masses of action. And I'd hoped that the relatives of Butterfly who come to celebrate her wedding, some of them perhaps slightly cynically, to this American visitor, provide a, a, a light relief. Some of them are quite comic. Their attitudes are rather grotesque. And this was, of course, something that Puccini realised was already happening. As the West found the Far East, wanted to trade with it, wanted to learn about it, in some cases want to make fun of it, so various members of the, the Far East would want to imitate the English, the Americans. They would want to build a bridge across. And so there are, there are parts of this libretto where it's quite clear that the Japanese energy is for change, not just hanging on to their past. But the presence of these two forces, of course, is what gives part of the opera its force. The music at the beginning, those of you who know this opera well will remember, is very unexpected. It's very fast. It's very furious. The strings coming in one group after the other, playing the same tune, a sort of dramatic fugue, very loud, very fast. And it gives the impression of, of great energy and activity. And to me, this suggests a new Japan, a new Nagasaki, a great port, full of industry, full of activity, full of aspiration. And into this world comes the marriage broker, who's not afraid of cracking a few dirty jokes with Pinkerton as she shows him the little house where he's going to live, where the walls go in and out, just like you will, sir. It's quite clear that Doc Goro feels that his way into Pinkerton is by being witty and by being very suggestive and lascivious. I love the, the, the light and shade in this opera. I love the speed of the conversations and the way the first act, as Puccini said he wanted it to be, is basically, until the last scene, a comedy, full of action, full of conversation, and full of promise for the way the opera is going to go. But of course, nobody knew that Butterfly makes this incredible, courageous gesture, the night before this wedding takes place, of renouncing the Japanese religion. And when the chief priest of the locality, the Bonds, as he called, finds out about this, he comes and breaks up the wedding celebration, denounces Butterfly, and everybody is scandalised, and denounces her too, and departs in fury, screaming. Butterfly, of course, is bereft, upset, cries, had hoped to get away with it. She wanted to be ready to give herself totally to her American husband. So it's clear right from the beginning of this relationship that she took it much more seriously than was expected. Now, the memory of the sound of the departing relatives never leaves us. It gives the tragedy a particular poignancy. And the last scene of the first act becomes this wonderful duet. One of the achievements of the opera is to suggest, I believe, that in Butterfly, Pinkerton found something in womanhood that he had never seen in America. The delicacy physically of her, her light sense of humour, her seriousness though as well, her charm, her beauty, but all on a tiny scale. And she says to him, we are a people used to understanding the little things of life. And we feel that he finds poetry in the course of this love duet, this famous scene that ends the first act as they go into the house together as night falls. By the time we start the second act, he's been long gone. She has the child and life is very different. But she, having made this great decision to, to renege on her religion, believes that he will come back. And she is steadfast that one day, as she sings the famous aria, the little film of smoke will come in the harbour and we will see another ship arrives and it'll be the ship that has my husband coming back to get me as he promised he would. So this defiance of hers, her foolhardy commitment and courage in the face of adversity, sees us through. And this is something that I think, of course, is great to portray for a great singing actress, but it's also a very, very moving portrayal through the music for the audience. I so wanted us in the Bridgewater Hall to enjoy what this could be, 
to use the various areas of the stage um, and to use them to show the different parts of the story clearly. I'd hoped that the other geisha girls who come to the wedding with her could be portrayed by some of the younger singers from the Royal Northern College of Music. And I hoped that the vividness of the portrayal of these characters, particularly if we had the four stage, as we've done sometimes in the past, would give the drama a vividness and a reality that wouldn't be there if we just stood and performed it all for you along the front of the stage. Madame Butterfly was one of the great disasters of operatic history. Its first night in February 1904 went very, very badly. And it's interesting to think, isn't it, in England, what was happening in 1904. Elgar was busy at work, becoming the great mature master, pushing himself towards his symphony, his great oratorios, the apostles, the kingdom, well behind him and wanting to move on to something bigger. And Puccini, meanwhile, in the north of Italy, was putting this project together in the most wonderfully original way. I'd hoped that we would be able to incorporate into our performance some of the passages from the original version. Because this opera, you see, after the first night, was withdrawn. The public behaved so badly and took everybody by surprise. The story is, you know, that the stagehands stopped their work during the rehearsals and tiptoed to the side of the stage in the wings to listen. And they were so thrilled and moved by what they heard. Everybody was expecting another triumph, like he'd already had with La Boheme and Tosca. But it wasn't to be. People called out and whistled. The soprano, Rosina Storchio, was the lover of Toscanini. And everybody knew that. And that didn't help. And there were various laughing catcalls. And there was a feeling that there was an anti-Puccini clerk in the audience determined to stop it being a success. So he took the score. He said nobody else must to be sold it, recorded, the publisher must give back all the scores, and he wanted to think about what he was going to do. Three months later, after he'd had many, many tortuous meetings with his colleagues, another Madame Butterfly was unveiled just east of Milan in Brescia in May of that same year, 1904, and it was a great, great triumph. And within a few months, it was being seen all over the world and it has remained one of the most popular and successful operas ever written. So what happened? Why was it such a disaster that he wanted to change things? Well, so often operatic disasters, as many of you will know, come about because of taste, because of fashion. The first act of Man of Butterfly in that first version was an hour, even with some cuts. It's about 55 minutes. The second act was an hour and a half. And that's long. And the, the public were not used to such length. They hadn't seen enough Wagnerian operas, if you ask me. And so they, they found it boring at the end. And they thought it was, uh, it was too long drawn out. But actually, what Puccini has written is one of the original works of music drama. The way he sets the conversations. It's not fair to say that he was short of musical ideas in this last act. Far from it. He just set the text for what it meant, for what the, the drama demanded of him. He was ruthless, original and unsparing. And sometimes the music is very restrained as it needed to be. And then finally, the drama, of course, builds up to her suicide and the overwhelming tragedy of the end. But in that first version, there were many things that were different. There were some remarks that didn't reflect too well on the Americans. And of course, nowadays, one could put those back and with a sense of time, distance, we can understand why they're there to make the tension between the two nations. But he did many other things as well. And some of them are very beautiful passages that he took out. And I had hoped that we might do some of those for you, just to put it in a broader context. Certainly, we should do it with one interval and trust that if the production that we do, the performance that we were going to do is good enough, it won't seem too long. The soprano who was going to come to Manchester and sing it for us was a very, very talented Japanese soprano who, as a young girl, had studied at Covent Garden. She was one of the young artists there many years ago. And I remember hearing her and working with her and being very impressed by her. And she has just started to do performances of Madame Butterfly, so this came at the right moment for her. 
But let's hope that sometime in the future we can get all this together again. I long to hear Puccini's sound world ringing round the Bridgewater Hall. I long to feel that the orchestra are bathing this acoustic that we have with these wonderful melodies, because he was a great writer of tunes. And of course, we should all acknowledge that in a good performance, it is very, very sad at the end, and it is very difficult to avoid what he always said he wanted, to make people cry.